Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Fat Jocks. You know what it is. You know what to do. Go over to Apple Podcasts. Give us a five-star rating. Write a five-star review. Send us over some emails to fatjocksquestions at gmail.com if there's anything you want us to talk about on the podcast or maybe you got some kind of gripe. We've got an incredible episode today, one of my favorite ones we've done. Brian, what do we do today? Today is a very, very special episode. Visiting with Fat Jocks Pod for the entire hour, five-time and current defending Iditarod Trail champion Dallas CV. We get into the ins and outs of what it's like being on the thousand mile frozen tundra dog race that is the I Did It Rod Trail. We get into his lineage. His father and his grandfather both have raced the I Did It Rod Trail and won the I Did It Rod Trail. He's the youngest to have ever won it, won it and his grandfather is the oldest to have ever finished it. Um, it's an amazing interview. You learn a lot about dog racing. Um, please uh, enjoy the episode and let us know what you think. Thank you. Personal file. 69 offense. He was giving them the business. This fat son of a bitch. He's fat. Hey, I'm just here so I don't get fired. He's fat. Playoffs? I just hope we can win a game. He's fat. I'm a man. I'm 40. I couldn't care less about the team struggling. So you could physically, you like, you know, if the conditions are right, you could actually take a dog all the way to Europe. Yes, it is theoretically possible. And people have skied that trek. Um, there are other people who have, have in fact mushed from the northernmost portion of Alaska over the top to Svalbard in Norway. And I believe it's also been done the other direction from Canada to Oh, what was the like from or like from Greenland to Russia or something insane wow. like that? Northern Canada or Greenland over to Russia, like kind of going the opposite, making sure. an X over the top of the planet. Um, now, the length of time that that Arctic Ocean is fully frozen is not that long, and then even when it is fully frozen, those ice sheets are moving. I mean, there's it's unlike Antarctica. There's no land mass underneath. It is all right. water. Right. So it's yeah, it would be a challenge. I think it would be doable. Um, or it is doable, but I would, I've always wanted to do that one unassisted, literally take off from Alaska and mush unassisted all the way to Norway. I think that'd be pretty, pretty epic. Um, yeah. So yeah, maybe when I get pretty bored, epic. I'll do that. <laughs> Dude, you'd be on yeah. Rogan if you did that. <laughs> <laughs> but for now, I'll just, I'll just settle for you guys. Yeah. Okay. We're, we're, yeah, we're, we're a minor league. Here. Yeah, I did a ride to get to here. When you cross the globe, then you get to Rogan. <laughs> yeah, it would you'd be right. just telling him that for three hours and him being like, wow. Like, Did you have to <laughs> wolves? That's crazy. That, that was a pretty good impersonation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hey, Voke, just want to make sure you're good on your end recording-wise, yeah? Uh, no, I do not have permission to record. I hope you were recording. But I, I recorded my- that. I just wanted to – do you have permission now? Mm. Yep, yeah, I'm rolling. Cool. Okay. Sweet. Um yeah, that's. I imagine once you get out there and it's just ice, you're like, well, there's no real going back. Once you cross a certain point and you're like, okay, well, it's ice both ways right now. So, <laughs> yeah, you definitely hit a point of no return on that one. Or, yeah, and you'd have to time it right in the late, late winter, early spring um, mm-hmm. when the ice gets frozen up. And then also you want to hit that freeze thaw cycle where it's warm enough in the daytime. Mm-hmm. that you actually it starts to melt the surface snow a little bit and when it cools off at night it creates a nice crust mm-hmm. because traveling where there isn't a trail is challenging for a dog team particularly if that snow is you know three feet deep you're yeah, not just cruising fluffy. down the trail like yeah. you would be on the Iditarod where you have a trail to follow that makes a world of difference and it's you can't you know overestimate the difficulty of having to make a trail as you're going so a trip across the top of the globe, are you able to carry that much food or would you, you know, be shooting some seal along the way? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I think you hit the nail right on the head there. I think to really honestly be able to do that unassisted, you would have to, um, you, you know, befriend a few seals along the way and borrow some <laughs> of the flower. So. <laughs> do some uh, Han Solo shit and crawl inside some animals. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, and that's actually a, what you had said. Is a big concern out there as well. Yeah, have it's you ever had a polar bear meat? Uh, have I ever had polar bear meat? Are you probably not allowed to even say you have if you have? <laughs> no, I, I've never eaten polar bear. You know, to be honest, I'm, I'm trying to think if I've ever actually seen a polar bear in the wild. I don't think I have. Um, I've been in the right places to see them. Just haven't really ever done that. Um, I would like to. You know, I've been up in Barrow and there's definitely polar bear around there. I don't think I've been far enough north in Norway to see polar bear, but someday I'd like to. I yeah, know that a few years ago, 15, 20 years ago, probably they, for some reason there was polar bears far enough South that they saw them on the Iditarod. So Musher came into a checkpoint and reported that they had seen a polar bear. Of course, the race officials, you know, thought they were hallucinating, which happened. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. <laughs> yeah, we're going to get into that. Now, believe me. There's no way polar bears don't come this far South. And then another musher came in and said they saw a polar bear. And then the race folks were thinking, well, there's probably an iceberg that looks like a polar bear or something. And it's just throwing people. And then a camera crew came in and said, we got video of a polar bear. And then, then they started taking it seriously because <laughs> we carry a handgun with us or many of the mushers do. I do sure. for moose protection, but none of us carry anything big enough to actually handle a polar bear. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, you, you would put all eight rounds in that thing. It wouldn't even pierce the fat layer. I bet. <laughs> that's well, what everyone says is the like, problem. there's, yeah. there's like, there's not rules, but it's like, okay, if you see a black bear, do this. If you see a grizzly bear, do this. But it's like, if you see a polar bear, there's not really a, yeah, a, a, by, a by the book way to handle it. <laughs> the difference you know, between was, people like you and me is uh, when you said, I've never seen a polar bear, I'd like to. That, that <laughs> I would never, there's no situation where I'm like, man, I'd I don't even want to see him in a zoo. <laughs> Those we had a, we had a polar bear up here in Alaska for a long time at the zoo, and he was quite famous. I think his name was Binky or something, something unbecoming like that. And uh, <laughs> I think he mauled several people. It, it may have been a she, I don't know. But Sorry. for some reason, there was like some college kids that decided they wanted to swim in the polar bear pool. Always <laughs> college didn't kid. didn't work out too well. It's always a college kid, yeah. When I was in San Francisco, <laughs> yeah, when I was in San Francisco, some kids threw rocks at the tiger cage and the tiger jumped out of the zoo and mauled them. <laughs> and even the news anchor was well, very I'm, unsympathetic. He was like, yeah, well, that that's what yeah. happens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You, you imagine like humanity somewhere in the realm of, let's say, 10,000 years ago, and, and we had to be able to navigate you know, animals in the wild and the stuff you had to do and be successful as that to survive as a human 10,000 years ago versus now. Right. But we still have people getting it wrong, right? The animal, the tiger's in a dang zoo and you're in a city and you still get mauled by a yeah. thing, right? So you wonder how would they have fared 10,000 years ago with, you know, the American lion or whatever we had over here that was 20 something feet long and right. was eating human. You know, it would have been a... I would yeah. imagine there wouldn't be a lot of people... Make yeah, I don't think those people would have really existed. They wouldn't have been allowed to. Uh, <laughs> yeah, not a lot of Nature pranksters back then. <laughs> so it's not old pranksters. I have a question about the Iditarod because I've watched, you know, the National Geographic. By the way, you are the most famous. And I noticed you call them mushers. And uh, if you look up dog racing on Wikipedia and all this stuff, they're very adamant to say nobody says mushing anymore. Uh, but you no, said that's not true. Yeah, so no, you're the, it's yeah. the sport of mushing. The, yeah. the person that is doing the activity is a musher. The dogs are sled dogs. Um, but what we, I would say is when you go with the dogs, like when you start moving, mm -hmm. we don't say mush. That's not the command you would give. And that's something that Disney, I think, would probably get wrong. Right. Is we usually would say, all right. I mean, for me, it's all right. You know, so you're just letting the dogs know, like, okay, I'm going to let you go now because they are so forward oriented that, you know, there's not a command to like make them go. Basically, right. when I pull the snow hook, which is our anchor out of the ice, I want to alert my lead dogs that the team's about to move because obviously at the front of the line, they're the last ones to get the memo as far as, you know, how the physics of it work when the back Absolutely. dogs start pulling the sled. Um, so I'll tell them, all right. And probably the most common command would be hike. Hike, yeah. Like H-I-K-E. Um, to, like to go. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Wait. Um, but I was, I was watching a lot of videos on this. First of all, these dogs are not in any way pets, right? They don't sit or anything like that. Right. Well, they seem nice. I wouldn't say that they're not pets. They, they do. I mean, I've got six or seven retired sled dogs that live in our main, um, 
kind of crew commons area. It's also where the tours come and go. Mm -hmm. It's just our main gathering place up here. Like I have crew cabins that aren't very big. It's where people have their per personal belongings and they sleep, but the kitchen and the bathrooms and the living room and the TV, that's all in the big lodge building. Right. So that's where the right. dogs live. So they're, they make great pets, but when they're actively racing, they come when they're called, but we don't really spend time teaching them sit, lay down, roll over, shake, <laughs> you know, their commands are G and ha for right and left mm -hmm. and, you know, other commands for steering the team and speed commands and whatnot. Um, they're friendly, just like a house pet. They do make excellent house pets once they're, the, the reason I say once they're retired is because they're a high energy dog. They're an active right. dog. It's not really fair to them to, to breed a high energy active dog and then ask them to sit on your couch <clears throat> and do nothing. They're not going to yeah. be happy doing that. But once they're nine, 10, 11 years old, they're still active. They still like to run. They're very healthy dogs through the entirety of their life. Um, but at that point, they're happy to go for a run with you or go for a hike with you. Or if you're going to go for a bike ride and they get to jog along for 10 miles, they're super happy to do that and then lay on the couch the rest of the day. So they're, they're great dogs that way. That rules. Wait, so they can race up to eight years old? They race up yeah, to like so 10, my, right? Um, well, as far as like seriously competitively racing, um, I would say eight is kind of a, is exceptional mm. or, I mean, it's, good but it's not remarkable like nine-year-olds definitely race competitively but at the super high end um let's say if you're trying to be in the top five of the iditarod and you're mm -hmm. going to be you know have a shot at winning it um eight would be a, probably the oldest you would see regularly be able to do that so this year on my team my team ranged from three years old up to gamble who is my my older super leader and he is eight years old Interesting point on Gamble is I think he just became the dog with the longest span between his first win and presumably his last win this year. He won in 2016 and he just won again in 2021. So a pretty nice long career, phenomenal lead dog. And he was one of my yellow rose lead dogs at the end of the race. So damn, that's yeah. like Ray Lewis's career. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, Ray Lewis, so he won one when he was like 20 and then 40. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so then he's your lead dog. So, you know, cause that's a question I had written down is like kind of throughout the year, you have a dog all year where you're like, he's the lead. It's not like a Rudolph situation where you're like kind of end of the camp. You're like, all right, Hey, you're the lead now. Like there's a dog specifically you know, that, you know, all year is going to be your lead. Yes. And no, um, all the, all these questions are going to have complicated answers. Um, or at least at minimum, I would like, make it complicated. So <laughs> if you're um, just like, yeah, it's exactly like Rudolph, Bruce. <laughs> <laughs> to a T. <laughs> um, no, in, in a given dog team, like this year, I would say out of my 14 dog team, I would call 10 of them lead dogs. Now there are lead dogs that are better than other lead dogs. Certainly there's maybe only four on that team that they're just not going to, they're not suited for leaders. They're going to goof around too much. They're too much of a joker. They'd rather be in the back of the team, pull hard and not have to worry about anything. Mm -hmm. Um, so I do have some leaders that are my key leaders. For example, this year, I'd say profit Northwest Pecos and gamble were the ones that, and, and Cobra picked up most of the leading shifts. There were other dogs like Viacon that I'd put up there with another experienced leader. The lead position is the hardest job. And I don't want to put one dog in that position the whole way. Cause in addition to the physical stress. difficulty, there's a mental stress. So North and Gamble, did, they were the two super key lead dogs in this race. And there were other dogs that were kind of helping them or on runs that I knew were easier. I could put up some younger lead dogs and let them give the older guys some breaks. So it's kind of like having a relief pitcher in there. You might have one that's a superstar, but you want to rotate them out and make sure that guy's fresh when you need him to be fresh. Right. Yeah. Interesting. This race was shorter this year, right? It was. Yep. Uh, and that's one thing I was really concerned about going into the race. Due to COVID and us trying to be conscientious of the native villages and the remote towns that we travel through along the race mm -hmm. and not wanting to spread any, any COVID out there, because um, it, not just the mushers traveling, there's the whole race support staff and like the checkers and the officials. As a musher, we don't have a support staff. But when we get to right. a checkpoint, there's volunteers that you know place the food drop bags and the straw for the dogs and put in a big pile. And they're going to take our time when we arrive. There's a right. huge vet staff that's right. caring for the dogs. Again, not really caring for the dogs. They can't help us do massages. But if I have a dog that has an issue or I'm concerned or they just do a, a vet exam at every checkpoint just because and I choose to leave one of those dogs behind, those vets are the ones that are going to be taking care of that dog for me for the next day or two until they can fly it back to Anchorage and then it's returned to my kennel. 
but my team goes on with one less dog. And that's why maintaining a healthy team is so important is you don't get replacements. So anyway, they did opt to go to the halfway point essentially and turn around and go back the same way that they came, which kept us in um, some more remote parts of Alaska, kept us away from the villages on the Yukon River and on the Bering Sea coast. And it resulted in a race that was a little more than 100, 120 miles shorter than is typical for the Iditarod. And you were sleeping outdoors this year, right? Yeah, there was, I mean, we already camp outside a lot. Um, I stop in some portion of the checkpoints, but not all the checkpoints. Mm -hmm. I view the checkpoints as resupply depots. Mm -hmm. So when I arrive in a checkpoint, you know, the vets are going to do a quick examination on the dogs. This is if I'm just continuing down the trail, I will go get my food supply bags that I filled up and sent out two weeks prior to the race. I'll get out the food that I need for the dogs, the food that I need for myself, new booties for the dog's feet, you know, fuel to cook for the dogs. If I'm going to camp out on the trail, I'll bring a bunch of straw that we use for bedding for the dogs to get them up off the snow and ice when they're resting. I'll load that into my sled and continue down the trail and camp out somewhere on the, on the trail. If we stop at a checkpoint, of course, those amenities are there. And this year they did have, um, some Arctic oven type tents set up. It's basically a, a large heated tent. Mm -hmm. And, uh, that was really nice. I didn't take advantage of those in too many places. I think I only slept in one once, um, the whole way, as far as those tents were concerned, other places like McGrath is a larger town and they mm -hmm. had a, a small aircraft hangar available for us. So just a large building with, you know, kind of mats thrown on the floor. So there's different accommodations depending on where you're at. When you're, when you set up in this, I, I picture the Iditarod being like, kind of like old school baseball where, you know, like there's like nine guys who take it very seriously. So they set every record and then you got the other guys who have like day jobs and, you know, they're just lucky to be there. Um, when you're racing, how many people are you like, all right, this is my competition. Is it, is it like the whole group? Are they all elite racers? No. Uh, well, yes and no. I mean, by, by virtue of being at the Iditarod, I would say that they, it puts them in the top, you know, few percentile of the sport, but certainly within that, there are people that know, okay, I have a realistic chance at winning the Iditarod. And there's a lot of people that their best case scenario is finishing the race. Or, you know, we see very commonly people trying to break into the top 20, which are like the paying positions Mm -hmm. And that's a mark of a very successful race. If, if you're a racer that's finished in the top 20, 20 of the Iditarod, you're a serious racer, right? right. You have a very nice dog team. You're, you put in the time. Um, you know how to develop that team. You're running a professional kennel. And that's probably what you do for a profession. Um, perhaps in the summer season, you're working tourism or commercial fishing or something where in the summer season, you're able to make enough money to then devote your entire winter to racing. It's not common for somebody to be in the top 20 and they're, you know, working a nine to five job right. um, all winter long. That's not, you're not going to see that. I don't think at least not commonly. What's the qualification process. The qualifications for the race for the Iditarod are primarily about proving you're competent with a dog team that you're able to travel sustainably with a dog team while keeping yourself and those dogs in superb health. So the qualifications are not so much about competitive qualifications, not yet. Um, I think you have to do two 300 mile races in one 200 mile race. Now with that, we do have like a report card system. So I have a couple handlers here at the kennel that were getting qualified or starting to do their qualifying races this winter. So when they signed up for these mid distance races, as we call them, um, they have to inform the race that they want to utilize this race as a qualifying race for the Iditarod. Now, during the race, there, there are the race officials and the vets that are basically grading them throughout the process. So even if you finish that race and they said, yeah, you finished, but you know, you were not handling sleep deprivation well, or your dogs lost a little bit of weight more than they should have in a 300 mile span, then um, you, you're going to get a subpar grade. And the Iditarod, they don't have to accept you just because you accomplish these races. So you right. apply to sign up for the Iditarod. They look at your qualifications and they say, yeah, all right, you've done five 300 mile races, but you haven't gotten three of these things with, you know, a plus report cards. So we'll tentatively accept your application, but we want to see you accomplish one more mid distance race with an A plus grade, or they'll say, you're not qualified yet. Do more mid distance racing, you know, make sure that right. you're ready to take on this challenge. Cause it's a serious thing when yeah. you're out there on the trail, 
there's not, it's not like you can just get out your cell phone and say, come help me. And there'll be somebody in 10 minutes. That's not how it works. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. I've seen, I've seen some highlights of like, uh, there was one lady who was a racer who broke her back, taking a turn a few years ago. And, uh, you know, I think she had like a four year break before she could come back. Uh, yeah, it seems like no joke. There's, there's been some serious injuries out there to say the least just this year. One of my favorite people to race with, um, a musher that I respect quite a lot, Ali Zirkel, was running her final Iditarod. Um, she was second in the race three years in a row. Uh, the first year I won my uh, first year that I won the Iditarod, she finished second, less than an hour behind me. The following year, my dad won the Iditarod. Who's my my dad's was my arch rival through most of my racing career. Yeah, um, and then again, she was second place, about 40 minutes behind him. The next year I won my second I did rod, and she finished two minutes and twenty-two seconds behind me. So oh, I'm a very top contender. And she um tipped over going into a checkpoint fairly early in the race on some glare ice. It was a very treacherous trail. Um, I think she may have broke her collarbone or did something on her shoulder or upper body. And had a very serious concussion. Uh, she was able to make it to the next checkpoint under her own power, but then was, you know, air rescued out of there with a Blackhawk. So, yeah, and that's one of the best mushers in the world. <laughs> right, right. So yeah, sometimes yeah. it's yeah. bad luck. It's not a skill thing. It's just bad luck. Yeah, I, I keep hearing her name. And all the things that I watch or read, it's like you, your dad, her, and then um, Jeff ben, Jeff King. Is that his name? Is that Yeah, I, yeah. Jeff King, he's like he's a top contender. I like the way you said it on Jeff. <laughs> I couldn't remember. Yeah. I can't remember. Couldn't remember. But you said so it's don't hate me. I just I just think of him as King Joffrey just because it's more fun that way. Yeah. <laughs> um, so whenever no, you no, say Jeff King, he's a great contender. And then Martin Boozer is another four time I did rod champion that was in this year's yeah. race. So whenever okay, because this is what I'm kind of trying to figure out. Because you guys all at the start, it's not like a like a stuttered race type thing. So you're not racing off of time. Are you racing? Does everybody start at the same exact time? Yes and no. Once again. Um, <laughs> so we start in two minute intervals. So it is spread out just a little bit in the beginning. Fortunately, the first, let's say hundred miles of the Iditarod trail is very easy to pass other teams. The first 60 or 70 miles you're on a river that's wide open. and It's very easy to pass teams. So the teams start to sort themselves out. The starting position is selected on a random draw. Now, during the race, we have a mandatory 24-hour layover. We have to stop down for a complete day. Now, truly, the only person that truly has a 24-hour layover is the last person to leave the starting line. The person that left two minutes ahead of them has 24 hours and two minutes. The next oh. person in front of them, 24 hours and four minutes. So my mandatory rest, I think, was 24 hours and 50 minutes this year. And that way, we're all even on the timeline once we leave that mandatory stop. So from that point on, we are racing each other. And when you approach the finish line, if you're ahead of somebody, you are ahead of them. It's not right. possible for you to finish and then to come in three minutes later and actually be ahead of you based on time. Right. Yeah. And in that 24 hours, are you just working on your sled the whole time? Um. Hopefully not. <laughs> no, hopefully <laughs> things are in good repair. And you know, but if you take a, a spill and break some stuff, then yeah, that's what you'll probably be spending your time doing. That's one of the few places that me as a human gets any significant sleep because I am the only person that can do anything for my equipment, for my dogs, for anything. So when I stop the dogs for let's say a four hour break, I'm going to be doing good to get a 45 minute nap for myself during that period. If I stop for a three hour break, which I did quite a lot of this year, um, I'm not sleeping, you know, I'm going to be hustling just to get everything done. You know, by the time I get the dogs fed and bedded down and get their shoes off, put the straw beds down for them, cook them their meal, put the ointment on their feet, do any massages I need to do, make sure they have their jackets on. Then I turn my attention to repacking the sled for the next run, any minor repairs, you know, put new plastic on the bottom of the runner so that it's slick and it's easy for the dogs to pull. By the time I get done with that, it's time to put new booties on the dog's feet, put them back into kind of mushing formation and get out of there. So um, the 24 hour break is an important one for the human to get some sleep. Otherwise you're going to truly be going seven to nine days. Um, well, this trail was shorter, so it was seven and a half days, but traditionally we would say eight and a half to nine and a half days for a winning team. Right. So I wonder, cause I want to get back to this hallucination, the white wall thing. 
Is that a combination of uh, the visual effects and the sleep deprivation? Because I know the way I've heard it described is that your hood, the the hairs of your hood kind of blur with your headlamp. And the next thing you know, you've got a TV screen where your mind is just showing you freaky (laughs) stuff. Uh, (laughs) That's one of the many ways. Yeah. Um, Heavy snow does the same thing where if it's really heavy snow and you have your headlamp on, the lights reflecting off those snowflakes. I feel like that's the easiest way for it to happen. Um, I've had hallucinations in, in heavy ice fog when it's 40, 50 below zero. And essentially all the moisture in the air is crystallized and it's just kind of hanging. It looks like a fog, but it's literally just ice more or less hanging in the air. It's kind of creepy. And the same thing, your, your headlamp will do, reflect off of that. But also if it's just a perfectly clear night, you get tired enough and you're forcing your eyelids to stay open. Your eyes are open, but your brain is shutting down and going to sleep. And you're right. dreaming while half awake, basically. And that's what a hallucination is. Well, kind you of get the visual you. hallucination <laughs> and you also get the audible hallucinations where you're Whoa. actually hearing stuff, which is kind of weird. Um, like I, I see, that like animals. See, I would be out there. I'd be like, oh, bang, bang, bang. Just, just hallucinating <laughs> and I'm shooting into the wild and Yosemite Sam style. Wait, I oh, yeah, exactly. Bruce, if you ever run the idea around, I'm going to try to stay a really long ways away from you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just I, got, yeah. <laughs> I have big plans to have an all pit bull team and be like the real bad boy of the <laughs> idea rod. <laughs> well, then I'm definitely going to try to stay a long ways away from you. <laughs> Yeah, what, uh, I want to know what you're seeing and hearing, though. I'm really interested in what that's like because I've done a lot of drugs, um, <laughs> I, and uh, but uh, I can never get over the edge with hallucinations. And I'm done now. I'm sober now. But like, I never had a good hallucination, and I was jealous of everybody. So I want to know what, what you see it and hear it. <laughs> well, aside from sleep deprivation, I I haven't done any drugs, so you know I've I've gotten my fix on on just not sleeping, I guess. But um, that's a, that's a drug. See, one of the, I, I guess so. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> one that's of the, the purest um, drug you can take. <laughs> the it's not baby. healthy for you. <laughs> Dude, I, I recently was reading something about the amount of brain cells that get killed off in extreme sleep deprivation versus drug use, and it's unfortunately pretty comparable. But um, oh, nice. Welcome yeah, that's my excuse. Club, that's my excuse, and I'm sticking to it. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> one of the first major hallucinations I remember, I was doing a, a mid distance race. It was very very cold out. A lot of ice fog. I had my my wolf ruff pulled up around my face, and it was all frosted up. And my headlamp's trying to shine out, and it's kind of reflecting off those guard hairs, like you were explaining. Mm -hmm. And I was only, I think, sixteen at the time, and I was not very good at handling sleep deprivation at that point. It's gotten Mm -hmm. much easier as I've gotten older. And I kept kind of nodding off, and then kind of like you know nodding off and waking up, like when you're driving and you really Mm -hmm. shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. Um, And one of those times, I, I woke up and I opened my eyes. And I could still hear the dogs running. I could hear the dogs breathing. I could hear my my brakes from my sled on the ice. But I could all I could see was my my family's kitchen, like this view from the living room looking into the kitchen, mm-hmm. brightly illuminated, perfectly detailed. And I knew it wasn't real, but that made no difference. I could not get that vision to go away. I'm blinking my eyes. I'm rubbing my eyes. And every time I open them up, my brain just kept going back to that same thing. It right, was the you weirdest could interact thing. with the kitchen, right? Like you could go make a cup of coffee. Or no, just and step anyway, off the sled. <laughs> I would have loved a cup of coffee, man. It, yeah. it's also, it was 40 something below zero. It would have been warm, right? <laughs> but, um, you know, I couldn't get it to go away. And I'm, I'm kind of worried because I need to be able to see my team. We're out on this wide open frozen river with no snow on it so that it's easy for the dogs to just kind of meander wherever. I can't see where they're going. I can't see. It's kind mm-hmm. of a little bit scary uh another one similarly i was on uh what's that nothing keep going i don't want to interrupt you uh, I, I was just <laughs> yeah, this rocks. another one i think on that same race years later um just the way that the river ice was broken up like the ice and then the snow patches on the ice and then the the bank the far bank of the river with the trees mm-hmm. every time i i opened up my eyes what i would see was the houses that are on stilts because the snow was going like kind of vertically and wind blown drifts on the river ice. And it looked like the stilt legs and then the trees, my brain turned it into the bottom of a house, which in these villages, a lot of the houses because of permafrost are on these little stilts, they're up high. Mm -hmm. And I kept thinking that we were mushing underneath one of those. So I'd wake up and I duck down because I thought I was about to crack my head on one of of these houses. I'm thinking my dogs are mushing like underneath these houses. It was the weirdest thing. And it sounds like the point where it's just, 
your brain is just projecting about where you want to be. It's almost like an oasis. Like you just, your brain's yeah. like, let's get inside. <laughs> there you go. You know? That's what it is. <laughs> yeah. It sounds like, like when you hear stories of like people that almost died and they're like, I went to this place and th- like I was in my family's kitchen. It was beautiful and warm and I had pancakes. Like that's literally what it sounds like the entire time. I'd be time. so pissed if I spent nine, you know, nine days in the winter and started hallucinating and all I was was in a dumb kitchen. <laughs> I would be so bummed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You want to be on a, in like, another dimension. Know, I dream a genie yeah. coming out of a lamp or so- something cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. No, the, the hallucinations have always been kind of disappointing in content, at least. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's actually kind of what Brian is saying is, I've been thinking about this because you stop at these checkpoints whether it's for however long of a thing, is there like, you're kind of too busy with the thing. Cause is there like, I did a rod groupies that are like hanging out at the checkpoints. They're like, Ooh, Dallas. Yeah. Trail bunnies. Yeah. Trail bunnies. Yeah. Yeah. Just in like, you know, 18 inches worth of insulation. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so it's not quite like NASCAR in that regard. I don't think. Um, and, but no, when we're racing, you're, you're pretty well focused on your dog team. And the, the villages are nice. It's fun to go through these towns. It's fun to see kind of the area that that sled dogs had their heyday. When you go back, you know, hundreds or thousands of years, these are the same places that sled dogs have been running and traveling and helping humans to exist here. If you look yeah. back through Alaskan history, it would have been very, very hard for humans to survive in this environment without the aid of sled dogs. And that's kind of what we're celebrating with the Iditarod. So there's mm-hmm. something pretty cool and powerful mushing through these areas, knowing the sled dog history and thinking people were mushing sled dogs very similarly down this same trail, literally a thousand years ago. Yeah, that's, that's a pretty awesome thought. Yeah. So no, um, really cool. I'm out there in the remote stuff, but we're not hanging out in the towns and uh, on the whole, I try to kind of avoid, I don't want to say avoid the towns, but they seem like distractions. Yeah. My focus is very much on this little unit of this many dogs, my sled, me. And you're constantly thinking, what do I do next? As soon as I arrive and stop, what process am I doing? I'm trying to be very efficient and you're not wasting time out there. So we can celebrate after the race. Yeah. You're not like, man, I hope there's chicks up here at the. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not, not really. <laughs> I, I got in the wrong sport for that. <laughs> <laughs> man. Yeah. Now I'm but starting I to think maybe my, my Iditarod dreams aren't going to work out. My, my pit bull team <laughs> and my, my trail bunny hopes of meeting a bunch of chicks yeah. out on the trail. Maybe it's not going to work. <laughs> wait so I, I read a i read a new york article about you that said you were uh you were a wrestler when you were younger and they yep. claimed that your style of wrestling made you get three to four concussions a week i use my head a lot man what can i say <laughs> <laughs> i just use it as a battering ram typically um like a battle yeah, no i yeah <laughs> i i did, had a pretty good wrestling uh career i guess i don't know if it's long enough to call it a career, but, um, you know, for about seven or eight years, that was my focus and I was pretty, pretty focused on it. So I was the first Alaskan to win a national title in Olympic style wrestling. I was able to represent the U S on, um, at that point, like 125, 130 pounds, probably. Um, when I started doing like, you know, wrestling at the senior level, I was at the age where I could wrestle all the junior tournaments. And I was also going up and doing all the senior tournaments. I was ranked fourth for the senior world team. And first for the junior world team. And at that point I was wrestling 60 kilo internationally, which was uh, 132 pounds or something, which sucked since I weighed about 145 at 4% body fat. So there's, you can't really drop down much from there (laughs) except for water weight. Yeah. Um, I, I, I did do very well with losing, losing weight. I always made weight and I was always able to function afterwards, but I scared the living crap out of our coaches because I'd be, 10 or 12 pounds over with 10 or 12 hours to go. Right. And then you just, and then you're just down, like, watch you drop this. That water, <laughs> you wait, and then you spike back up. You don't want to spend two days dehydrated. There's no, no, you can't come back from that quickly enough. So it's a brutal way to do it, but it's an effective way to do it. And then wrestling. Yeah. I, I was pretty aggressive. Um, that was definitely my style was create a scramble, create a mess, get it out of the ordinary, get it out of the normal and uh, put people on their World heels tactic. and I always came out of a scramble pretty well. I was flexible, had good body awareness. I was pretty tall for my weight class. So I had good reach. Um, and I think that was kind of our strong suit was being able to make it a scramble, being able to make it a fight and uh, being able to make it miserable for the other people. Give them an excuse to want to quit. Give them, a, right. give them an excuse to be, it's okay to lose to me. 
right? If they can yeah. go back to their coach or their dad and say, yeah, you know, here's my excuses. They'll take it nine times out of 10. If you hand somebody a pre-made excuse. Mm-hmm. So yeah, maybe I'm a little bit too violent with my forehead. Maybe I'm a little too violent with my forearms. I'll take the penalty point, but I just gave them an excuse that, you know, I was being violent. Yeah, yeah. I was being violent. And the rules say <laughs> I can penalize the point. Make your penalty point, but now you have an excuse. <laughs> yeah. And you take that mentality straight to the trail. That mentality clearly has not left you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, the fun thing with mushing, though, it, it has forced me to grow as an athlete and really compartmentalize a lot of stuff. When it comes to me, yeah, I'm, I'm the kind of guy that leaves it all on the trail. I'll run up every single hill. I'll sit there and pedal and ski pole until I literally pass out on the sled. Mm-hmm. Um, I've done that one a few times. And when I get done with a race, I'll be beat up enough that I can't walk from the finish line to the car, right? That's right. how I myself. Now with the dogs, you've got to shift gears. Now right. this is about caring. It's about supporting. So in that regard, you're almost like mommy. And mm-hmm. at some point I have to recognize that as much of an athlete as I think I am, I'm never going to be anywhere close to what a sled dog can do cardiovascularly. Sure. No human is. Nope. It's just not possible. So the best use to my energy, the best use to my efforts and time and attention is on maintaining perfect health with those guys. If I do that, then it's kind of a force multiplier where, yeah, I can run up every hill and be exhausted and I'll help the dog team this much. But if I take that same energy and move quickly and get the dogs 10 minutes extra rest in the checkpoint, it has this much benefit. Mm-hmm. So it's about knowing where to apply that pressure, knowing how to apply that energy and being able to focus down a lot of energy into a short window of time and be an animal and then being able to zoom out and plan your race for the next six days and then zoom back in and power through a storm or a blizzard. Right. So being able to manage yourself is a big part of it and make sure right. you're, you you get the right attitude for the job that you're doing. I imagine. Yeah. yeah. But you still, you give those other racers an excuse. You still do that. Like yeah. if I were on the Iditarod and I was like, I came in second, look, I lost to Dallas. What am I supposed to do? You know what I mean? <laughs> that, that excuse is there. Five-time champion, only one, right? No, there's yeah, one no, other there's one. There's one, Rick Swenson. And he won, I think the four, fifth ever Iditarod was his first win. And this was, you were talking about baseball in the early days, right? Yeah. If we go back to the Iditarod in the 70s and the 80s, you know, if you took it seriously, you were going to be in the top five. Right. Uh, so Rick, Rick Swenson won the real five five eight rods. <laughs> well, I'm not going to say real or fake um, <laughs> because my, my argument is it doesn't matter. If you win the Iditarod, you beat the best in the world at that time. You know, because I, I just recently took a couple of years off of racing and there was, you know, hype about, well, if you had been here, it's like, it doesn't matter. I wasn't there. Those right. guys that won the Iditarod beat everybody that showed up. That is all you can ever ask an athlete to do is beat everybody who shows up. And that's exactly what they did. And we had three new champions in 2018, 19 and 20. And that's really good for the sport too. seeing new champions kind of Mm -hmm. breaking out of that. We're good to, we are freaking great. Right. Right. And that was, uh, you are awesome. And then Pete Kaiser and then Thomas Verner from Norway, this last or in 2020. Anyway, um, I, I'm going to give these guys a run for their money. Yep. We're going to make them work for it. No, yep. I might get beat. If you're going to spend your life in sports, you better be damn good at losing because you're going to spend a lot of time doing that. Mm-hmm. But if they're going to beat me, I'm going to make them earn it every single time. And it's going to hurt. <laughs> you're going to have to be ready to run up every hill and we're going to demoralize them wherever we can. Yep. And yeah, you're going to try to get them to do something foolish. Like this year I was out ahead early and I, I know the mentality of racers. And if they were going to try to catch up with me, they start to panic a little bit and take off too soon. Or many of them, I think, decided that we were out of reach and they just let let us go. Um, mm-hmm. Never even really kind of raced us um, from about 300 miles into the race. They were already determined that this thing was decided. So yeah, we we want to make it we want to make it hard for them to um, to do their job. I want to make it hard for them to make the good decisions. I want to set them up to where they have to make difficult decisions. The mm-hmm. more difficult decisions they make, the more times they're going to slip up. Yeah. You really are the top That's the poker mentality there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So how do you, how are you cognizant of where everybody else is? How do they give you that information? Do you have like an app or something? Bro, he's not even thinking, dude. He's just, he's just forward no. ahead. Just There's no way you don't know where everybody is. <laughs> so previously we weren't allowed to have any two way communications at all. So you were not allowed to have a phone. You were not allowed to have a sat phone or, you know, an in reach that you can, you know, satellite texting, stuff like that. Um, so that was up till 2000, 
17 or 16, that rule changed that they started to legalize two-way communication, Mm -hmm. um, which I was not a proponent of that rule change. Mm -hmm. In fact, I was very much against that rule change. But um, during those years, the only information we we would get is when you arrived in the checkpoint, they would often have a printed out sheet of what time each musher arrived and departed from the checkpoints. That's the only data you would have. Right. So it, it might say that the musher took, you know, 10 hours from this checkpoint to this checkpoint. And then there'd be somebody that took, you know, 14 hours in between the checkpoint. And you know that they stopped and rested in there, but you didn't know what their traveling speed was. Did they stop and rest for three hours and take 11 hours to cover that distance? Or did they stop and rest for five hours and it only took them nine hours, which means they got a fast, strong dog team. We didn't have that data. Now, this was the first race that I've run that we actually, I, I took an in reach with me, um, which allows me to get text. I didn't really use it because I'm not heck savvy at all. <laughs> but um, I did get a few texts while I was out there of basic information. But um, I, was, I was so useless at using that thing, like text would come in and I didn't know when it was from. Was this from yesterday or today or tomorrow? Mm-hmm. I don't know when this thing was sent. So um, <laughs> I, I need to get maybe get better at that. But my concern with having the two way communication is it turns the mushers into jockeys rather than right. the, the play callers in the field with the information. And that's always what I thought was cool about this race is you've got to make good decisions under duress. You're sleep deprived, you're struggling, and you've got to make a, a good decision. And you've got to be able to understand why you're making that good decision. Am I deciding to stay for an extra hour at this checkpoint truly because my dogs need it? Or am I exhausted and I'm coming up with an excuse to stay for an extra hour? Right. Yeah, yeah. It's much I, easier very, if your coach calls in and tells you what to do. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's kind of like what you were saying with like how you like it because it's like this is what's been going on in this specific place for a thousand years. So you're like, the, 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 it's kind of the same thing with baseball a little bit where people will argue things like that because they're trying to keep the purity of the sport intact, the classical nature of the sport. I think you guys spend a lot more time watching baseball than I do. <laughs> there's, <laughs> yeah. there's this i wanted to ask you this, this is a, we could start to wrap up here it's just a fan question that somebody had because for anyone who's not familiar you had one in what was it 14 15 and 16 and then yeah, 2012 14 15 16 yep yeah and then your dad beat you in 2017 and then you had gotten you second place. That at all, could you? No, I'm sorry. Your dad, <laughs> your dad, yeah. that way <laughs> your dad just barely muscled it out. You must have overslept at one of the checkpoints or you had a bad yeah, yeah, you know, break. Some, some excuse. There's got to be an excuse, right? <laughs> right. Come on, Dallas, please help me. There's, but it's, it, I mean, it's kind of, so somebody was kind of curious what that was like. And it's like, that's just such a, a, there's not a lot of sports where that's going to happen, where it's not like Tom Brady's going to be the only thing standing between Tom Brady and his record Super Bowl is his dad on the yeah, other I team, mean, you know, like NASCAR, maybe. Yeah, NASCAR. It's like maybe, but yeah. it's like, yeah, it's just how no, it is, is that, like, it's truly remarkable. So, two things that come into play with that one is, um, so I won in 2012 and became the youngest person to ever win the Iditarod. Incidentally, the person who previously held that record was the same Rick Swenson. The, the, mm-hmm. uh, the other five-time champion. <laughs> right. um, so Rick Swinson was the youngest winner ever at 26 and change. I won it. I turned 25 the day before the race started, mm-hmm. and I became the youngest person to win the Iditarod. The very next year, 2013, my dad broke the record for the oldest person to ever win the Iditarod <laughs> at 53 or 54 years old, something like that. So already, I guess my dad and I, being who we are, we're already kind of at the extremes of young and old. And that was kind of, it was the right time period. It allowed us to compete against each other. So my dad wins in 2013. I finished fourth that year. The next year in uh, 14, I was first. My dad was third. In 15, I was first. My dad was second. In 16, I was first. My dad was was, uh, second again. And then 2017, he was first, again, breaking his record for the oldest person ever. And I was second (laughs) that year. So- there was six years in a row that my dad or I won. Three of those years, we were first and second place. Um, in fact, we, my dad likes to mention that if it weren't for the other one, both of us would have already been five-time champions because he's won three, <laughs> was second three twice, and I had won four and had been second to him once. So we, we were the only reason that we weren't already <laughs> five-time uh, champions. But um, my dad and I, we didn't work together at all. In fact, you know, he was my main competition. If there's anybody that I was trying to, you know, 
train better or be more efficient on the race to go 20 minutes faster. He was the one I was trying to beat. Like right. take 16, for example, he was 40 minutes behind me, um, in second place, third place, I think came seven hours later. Right. So we were pushing the pace big time. So he was the one I was trying to beat. And as much as I'd like to say that I just wanted to let him get one more win in 2017 and I was taking it easy. We all know that's not true. I gave it my all. (laughs) I felt like I had a fantastic race and he had an amazing race. He had an amazing dog team and uh, pulled off that, that uh, win. So it is unique. It is interesting to be in a sport that you can do that and that you can have father, son racing. What's that? You ever wrestle him? Oh yeah. So (laughs) wrestling, it also kind of runs in the family a little bit. My grandfather, um, Dan Seavey, who, re- who helped start the Iditarod, competed in the first Iditarod ever. He s- kind of started the wrestling program in his high school um, in Minnesota, <laughs> you know, long before he came to Alaska. I, he, I believe he just found like a, a wrestling book and he was able to get the, the football <laughs> coach to coach wrestling. And he knew nothing about wrestling, but it's like, all right, I'll get you in shape. You guys take it from there. My grandpa, true story. My grandmother and my grandpa met when my grandpa was a prize fighter at the circus or at the fair, like take any challengers, come up here and right. fight this guy. <laughs> yeah, <my laughs> was, a, a legend, was that bad? So, um, I, I think it was just grappling, right? I, I oh, don't think they were throwing punches, but it, yeah, he was, he was a beast. The guy was built. And uh, <laughs> so then my grandpa was a high school wrestling coach in Seward that my dad went to school at. My dad wrestled, um, and did quite well in, in the state and then went to and wrestled in college for some amount of time. So my dad's kind of the one that got me into wrestling and, and, um, he took a lot of pride and, uh, was very invested in helping me become a better wrestler and he was super supportive. So we've had a great relationship through the wrestling thing. You know, we were traveling all over the world together to Lithuania, to Bulgaria and all over the U S to tournaments. Um, and then it was kind of odd to be competing against him in the Iditarod. I almost felt like it was cheating because I, I knew him so well. Right. And when we were talking about kind of giving excuses and I knew how to hit him where it hurts, I knew his you know, propensity towards, you know, being nervous about being too far behind and, mm-hmm. and you, you don't want to use those things, but yet yes, you, you have do. to use those things. Yeah. Right. And so it was tough to race. But him. he knew all that about you too. Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah. I imagine he's out on the trail passing you, trying to pass you. He's like, hey, Dallas, remember that time you peed your pants and you're, you're like, stop it, Dad. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. I'm, I'm sure that's what he's doing. But, you know, it, it was good because when I was racing my dad and Allie Zirkel was at the top of her game at that point as well, I really enjoyed and appreciated and respected the people I was racing against. And from my standpoint, it was a really good uh, – like a healthy fuel, when you're trying to compete against somebody, it's easy to use the, the, I hate them. I don't want to get beat by them. And you're like angry at that person. Think about UFC or something, right? Mm -hmm. And you watch the way and, and they're fired up and they're trying to like, just generate this fuel, this hate for this other person and mushing, especially when it's people you like, and I don't want them to have a bad race. I mean, I, I feel bad when I, I pass my dad, my master strategy plays out perfectly. And I see him go from thinking he's got this one in the bag to everything just slipped away and I I'm feeling for him. Right. Right. But, um, I think it's just a good way to where you have to focus on, I'm going to do my best out of, you know, just virtue. That's what I'm going to do. I am going to do my best because that's what I do. Mm-hmm. I don't mind if these guys beat me, but I'm going to make it really, really freaking difficult for him to do that. And if my dad wins, I'm going to be happy for him. I'm going to be proud of him. I'm going to do everything I can to prevent that from happening. But at the <laughs> same time, if I'm having a crappy race and I'm going to finish in 10th, I sure as heck hope my dad is the one up there winning. it. Right. And so it's, it's weird when you're competing against people that you actually like. But so. <laughs> when was, when was the last time he pinned you? <laughs> oh, I mean, I was maybe 10 years old. <laughs> <laughs> that might be a slight exaggeration, but, um, <laughs> you know, I, yeah, he's going to come on here and rebuttal. Team. He's like, Oh, whoop <laughs> Dallas his ass anytime. <laughs> no, we, we should have had him on here at the same time, man. We, yeah. We, we've always had a pretty good banter back and forth. Um, <laughs> we're always talking crap to each other. And we, we can do that because we know it's out of, out of love. We, we both appreciate each other and we both have a lot of respect for each other. And so that allows us to just be absolutely brutal to each other when we're talking shit. <laughs> was it your grandfather in the 2017 race? Did I read that? He was in the 2012 race. 
was his last Iditarod. So the first one that I won was his last Iditarod. He's talking about doing it again. He's in his 80s now. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. But he's still, yeah, the guy is insane. He's still incredibly fit and healthy. Um, he, he's, he still has a handful of dogs that he just mushes recreationally. And it's incredible the stuff he still does with dogs. Like the trails he goes on are brutally tough. And he just acts like so he always sick. has. He's, he's not getting older. <laughs> wow. And where does he live? He lives primarily in Seward, which is on kind of South Central Alaska. Um, on, it's a coastal town. So they don't have great winters there. They get mm -hmm. a lot of wet, kind of heavy, wet snow, a lot of rain. There's not a lot of trails to work on because it's kind of fjords and steep mountains. So um, he, he actually has a cabin here at my place that he comes up to and, and spends a lot of time training his dogs here in the wintertime. But primarily he lives in Seward. Wow. Can you imagine being 80 years old and going to commute to dog race that's wild dude i would i would or, or running an extreme event at that age it's, it's crazy yeah that would be the best movie of all time is if you and your dad were first and second and then your grandpa just blazes past both of you with his <laughs> his old wily dogs and his old school tactics yeah <laughs> well, that's another thing that yeah. frustrates me about you winning five is that you never have a frozen mustache and I really like, that's what I look for in my Iditarod racers. I like a guy with icicles hanging off his face or if it's a girl, the icicles <laughs> hanging. Going on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was, that was go back to the, the nineties mushing, the early two thousands mushing. I'm thinking like the iconic mustaches of the time were Jeff King, my dad, Paul mm -hmm. Gebhardt. Um, mm -hmm. I want to say Ed Eaton, but I'm not certain on that. Uh, but yeah, that, that was like, the look right yeah for me yeah, yeah. personally i can't do the facial hair thing because it freezes to everything you yeah. end up with a big old snot sickles going on you go to do your zipper and it's like frozen to your face um <laughs> yeah so i can't do the the whole beard and mustache thing it's just too much effort for me so <laughs> Uh, well, we can we can wrap this up. We've held you for a lot longer than we said we were going to. Yeah, and, I could yeah. do this for ten more hours. This rocks, dude. Thank you so much, man. This is this is very I really appreciate your time. Yeah, man. Thank you. I think a lot of people really, are really enjoy it. Cause it's the not, not that just the knowledge isn't out there, but a, uh, a more kind of laid back conversation about what's going on. I don't think is out there as much as a lot of other things. So thanks so much, dude. Truly appreciate oh, it. Oh, I had one more question. I, I wanted yeah. to ask you how much is global warming affecting the idea to rod? That's a good question. You know, um, there are times that you think like, man, things are really changing. It's getting warmer. Um, and, you know, we're having to travel to train. But then the next year, we have like, record snow. This mm -hmm. year on the Iditarod, I was camping out in 55 below zero, which anybody who tells you that after 40, it's all the same is not true. That's they're <laughs> lying. It is definitely 55 below is definitely colder than 40 <laughs> below. I can vouch for that. Um, you know, so it's it's a factor. I don't think we've seen any major, major changes. We've had to reroute the Iditarod twice in, in recent history in 2015 and 2017 to take off from Fairbanks, which is farther north mm -hmm. than Willow, where the race generally starts. But another interesting thing that I wish I had better information on this, and I think a lot of people maybe do, but living in Alaska, kind of on the edge of the ice, um, you see the long-term effects of the end of an ice age, right? Mm -hmm. So I grew up in Seward. And it's a big fjord. That whole fjord was carved by glaciers receding for the last 10,000 years. And you walk to Exit Glacier, which I live just a few miles from Exit Glacier. In fact, when Obama came to Alaska back in whatever year, you know, bringing awareness to global warming, et cetera, that's the glacier that he visited. And they're mm -hmm. looking at the signpost. It's the glacier was here in 1950 and it was here in you know, 1970 and is here in, in, in 2000. It's been receding, right? Right. But what they didn't show was the signs that it was way the hell over there in 1800 and right. even five miles farther right. in 1750. Right? right. So it's hard to really pinpoint when we talk about global warming. If it's I wish I had a better grasp of the man-made effect versus the simple fact that we are at the end of an ice age and the ice pack used to stretch to North Dakota. Right. And right. Clearly it doesn't long right. before humans were able to do much more than rub a couple sticks together. Right. So, yeah. you know, it's, it's so hard for me to wrap my mind around living in the wilderness. I love the wilderness and I think it's very important to respect the wilderness. You know, when you're camping practice, leave no trace, all that good stuff. Um, but at the same time, I'm a, I value honest and clear information. 
And that's sure. what I, I really wish I had a way and anymore. Where do you even find that? Where can you find unbiased information? You're asking the it's wrong guy. I, mean, I was at jocks. Before. The fat jocks podcast <laughs> is where people come for unbiased information, <laughs> dude. All right. Excellent. <laughs> excellent. I love it. We're talking about awesome. you know, I, to answer that question. I can't say, you know, like, yeah, it's, it's, I didn't think we're definitely getting warmer, but the last couple of winters I have seen epically cold winters, um, with record snow. So it's kind of, yeah. it's kind of hard to say, well, at least where I live, it, it hasn't seemed to really impact me. And if you go to Fairbanks, those people will tell you, it'd be nice if global warming hurried the heck up. Cause it's 50 <laughs> below again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I definitely didn't want to put you on the spot about global warming in general. I just was wondering if there was no. any impact on the race itself. I'm just curious. And that's, that's my approach is I don't really have an opinion, but I just yeah. want to be able to have information. Right. I don't right. need to have opinion. I don't need to have been before right or wrong. It doesn't really matter. I just want to have good information now. And that's something we yeah. struggle with up here because that does come up a lot when you're in Alaska. Um, right, right. Yeah. Know, the impact of global warming. And it, I, I wish I knew better, you know, what was, what could be attributed to what, but that's way off the topic of sports. Um, yeah. I, I apologize. Say, thanks, I just... it's been, a, been way, way fun getting to chat with you guys. Um, yeah. Thanks, man. Yeah. yeah we got to do it again. when you. Yeah, Bruce, I think you're ready to go. You know, Dude, whether there's uh, the, the snow bunnies out there or not, I think I think the pit bulls and uh, <laughs> yeah, I, can, can I recommend that we get you like a cap gun or something so you can yes. feel like to practice. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, yeah. all right, sounds good. Cool. Yeah, dude, right, thank you, man. Black, <laughs> all right, guys. Thanks Have a great one, Dallas. Thank you so much, man. We'll talk to you later. All, all right. right, bye. bye.